What's going on everybody? Welcome to episode 13 of the Black Massacre series where today I will be discussing the Wilmington Insurrection of 1898. The Wilmington Insurrection of 1898, also known as the known as the Wilmington Coup of 1898, was a coup d'etat and massacre carried out by white supremacists in Wilmington, North Carolina, United States on Thursday, November 10th, 1898. The white press in Wilmington originally described the event as a race riot caused by black people. Since the late 20th century and further study, the event has been characterized as a violent overthrow of a duly elected government by a group of white supremacists. It is considered by historians to be a unique episode in the history of the United States. The coup was the result of a group of states, white Southern Democrats conspiring and leading a mob of 2,000 white men to overthrow the legitimately elected local fusionist biracial government in Wilmington. They expelled opposition's black and white political leaders from the city, destroyed the property and businesses of black citizens built up since the American Civil War, including the only black newspaper in the city, and killed an estimate 60 to more than 300 people. The Wilmington coup is considered a turning point in post-Reconstruction North Carolina politics. It was part of an era of more severe racial segregation and effective disenfranchisement of African Americans throughout the South, which had been underway since the passage of a new constitution in Mississippi in 1890, which raised barriers to the registration of black voters. Other states soon passed similar laws. Historian Laura Edward writes, what happened in Wilmington became an affirmation of white supremacy, not just in that one city, but in the South and in the nation as a whole, as it affirmed that invoking whiteness eclipsed the legal citizenship individual rights and equal protection under the law that black Americans were guaranteed under the 14th Amendment. In 1860, just prior to the outbreak of the American Civil War, the majority of Wilmington's population was black, and it was also the largest city in the state of North Carolina with a population of nearly 10,000. Numerous enslaved laborers and free people of color worked at the city's port and households as domestic servants and in variety of jobs as artisans and skilled workers. With the end of the war, freedmen who lived in many states left plantations and rural areas and moved to towns and cities not only to seek work, but also gain safety by creating black communities without white supervision. Tensions grew in Wilmington and other areas because of a shortage of supplies. Confederate currency suddenly had no value and the South was impoverished following the end of the Long War. In 1868, North Carolina ratified the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution resulting in the recognition of Reconstruction policies. The state legislature and governorship were dominated by Republican officials with the governor a white man and the legislature made up of both white and black people. Freedmen were eager to vote and overwhelmingly supported the overwhelmingly supported the Republican Party that had emancipated them and given them citizenship and suffrage. However, conservative white Democrats who previously dominated politics in the state greatly resented this radical change, which they deemed as being bought about by black residents, unionists, carpetbaggers, and race traders referred to as scallywags. Resentment also develop over Confederate veterans being barred from voting and holding public office in the state for a period after the war. Many white Democrats were already embittered by the Confederacy's defeat. Insurgent veterans joined the Ku Klux Klan, which orchestrated violence and intimidation to deter blacks from organizing and voting. Democrats regained control of the state legislature in 1870. After the KKK was suppressed by the federal government through the Force Act of 1870, new paramilitary groups across arose in the South. By 1874, chapters of Red Shirts, a paramilitary arm of the Democratic Party, had formed in North Carolina. Democrats developed a plan to subvert home rule, seeking to have local officials appointed by the state rather than elected by the people. They began circumventing legislation by taking over the state's judiciary and adopting 30 amendments to the state constitution, which affected widespread policy changes, including lowering the number of judges on the North Carolina Supreme Court, putting the lower courts and local governments under the control of the state legislature. 
rescinding votes of certain types of criminals, mandating segregated public schools, outlawing interracial relationships, and granting the General Assembly the power to modify or nullify any local government. By adopting these elements, the Democrats became identified as would-be bastions for white Americans. However, their control was largely limited to the western part of the state within counties where demographically there were re relatively few black Americans. As the Democrats chipped away at Republican rule, things came to a head with the 1876 gubernatorial campaign of Zebulon B. Vance, a former Confederate soldier and governor. Vance called the Republican Party begotten by a scallywag out of a mulatto and born in an outhouse. Through Vance, the Democrats saw their biggest opening to begin implementing their agenda in the eastern part of the state. However, in that region, poor white cotton farmers were often more fed up with the capitalism of big banks and railroad companies who charge high freight rates and use laissez-faire economics that worked against the already impoverished South. These farmers aligned with the labor movement, with many joining the People's Party, also known as the Populists. In 1892, as the U.S. plunged into an economic depression, the Populists banded with black Republicans who shared their hardships, forming an interracial coalition with a platform of self-governance, free public education, and equal voting rights for black men called the Fusion Coalition. Republicans and Populists agreed jointly to support municipal candidates. In the last decade of the 19th century, Wilmington, still the largest city in the state, continued to have a majority black population, with 11,324 blacks and 8,731 whites in 1890. There were numerous black professionals and businessmen among them and a rising middle class. The Republican Party was biracial in membership. Unlike in many other jurisdictions, black people in Wilmington were elected to local office and also gained prominent positions in the community. For example, three of the city's aldermen were black. Of the five members of the constituent board of audit and finance, one was black. Black people also served in the civic positions of justice, of the peace, deputy clerk of court, and street superintendent, and as coroners, policemen, mail clerks, and mail carriers. African Americans also held significant economic power in the city. Many former slaves had skills which they were able to use in the marketplace. For example, several became bakers, grocers, dyers, etc., making up nearly 35% of Wilmington's service positions. By 1889, many black people had moved into other areas of the economy as well. They began moving out of service jobs and into other types of employment where there was a higher demand for their work along with higher pay. At the time, black people accounted for over 30% of Wilmington skilled craftsmen, such as mechanics, carpenters, jewelers, watchmakers, painters, plasterers, plumbers, stevedores, blacksmiths, masons, and wheelwrights. In addition, they owned 10 of the city's 11 restaurants, 90% of the city's 22 barbers, and one of the city's four fish and oyster dealerships. There were also more black bootmakers and shoemakers than white ones. One third of the city's butchers were black and half of the city's tailors were black. Lastly, two brothers, Alexander and Frank Manley, owned the Wilmington Daily Record, one of the few black newspapers in the state and reportedly the only, daily, the only black daily newspaper in the country. With the help of patronage and equitable hiring practices, a few black people also held some of the most prominent business and leadership roles in the city, such as architect and financier Frederick D. Saguar. Thomas C. Miller was one of the city's three real estate agents and auctioneers and was also the only pawnbroker in the city, with many whites known to be indebted to him. In 1897, following the election of Republican President William McKinley, John C. Dancy was appointed to replace a prominent white Democrat as the U.S. Collector of Customs at the Port of Wilmington at a salary of nearly $4,000, which is equivalent to $130,288 in 2021. The editor of the Wilmington Messenger often disparaged him by referring to Dancy as Sambo of the Customs House. Black professionals increasingly supported each other. For example, of the more than 2,000 black professionals in Wilmington at the time, more than 95% were clergy or teachers, professions where they were not shut out from competing, unlike doctors and lawyers. As black people in the area rapidly emerged in their newfound social status and progressed economically, socially, and politically, racial tensions grew. Former slaves and their children had no inherited wealth. 
With the collapse of the Freedmen's Bank, which had a Wilmington branch in 1874, some black residents of Wilmington lost most of their savings and as a result, many distrusted banks. The debt slave metaphor, well known within the community, made many residents weary of debt. In addition, credit or loans available to them were marked up in price. The annual interest rate of credit charged up to black people was nearly 15% compared to under 7.5% to poor whites, and lenders refused to let African Americans pay off their mortgage in installments. This practice, known as principal or nothing, positioned lenders to take over black property and businesses through forced sales. The lack of inherited wealth, limitations to access to credit, and loss of savings through federal mismanagement and fraud created a combined effect in which black people could not save anything or otherwise acquire the means to own taxable property. Though they made up nearly 60% of the county's population, the property ownership among black residents in Wilmington was rare at just 8%. Of nearly $6 million in real and personal property taxes, they paid less than $400,000 of this amount. And while the per capita wealth for whites in the county was around $550, which is equivalent to $17,950, $915 in 2021, it was less than $30, equivalent to $977.16 in 2021 for black people. Despite this, affluent whites believe that they were paying taxes in a disproportionate amount, given the amount of property they own relative to the city's black residents, who now held the political power to prevent affluent whites from changing this ratio. Additionally, there was tension with poor, unskilled whites who competed with African Americans in the job market and found their services in less than demand than skilled black labor. Black people were caught between not meeting the expectations of affluent whites and exceeding the expectation of poor whites, paradoxically progressing too fast and too slow at the same time in the eyes of white residents. An example of the view that blacks were moving too slow can be found in the following excerpt from an 1898 magazine article. While thus numerically strong, the Negro is not a factor in the development of the city or section. With 30 years of freedom behind him, and with an absolute equality of educational advantages with the whites, there is not today in Wilmington a single Negro savings bank or any other distinctively Negro educational or charitable institution. While the race has not produced a physician or lawyer of note, in other words, the Negro in Wilmington has progressed in very slight degree from the time when he was a slave. His condition can be summed up in a line. Of the taxes in the city of Wilmington and the county of New Hanover, the whites pay 96 two thirds percent, while the Negroes pay the remainder three and a, half, three and a third percent. The Negro in North Carolina, as these figures show, is thriftless, improvident, does not accumulate money, and is not accounted a desirable citizen. This sentiment was echoed even among whites who aligned politically with African Americans such as Republican Governor Daniel L. Russell. An impression prevails that these colored people have grown greatly in wealth, that they have acquired homesteads, have become taxpayers, and given great promise along these lines. It is not true. In North Carolina, they had a fair chance, as in any other southern state, perhaps better than any other. And here it is sad to hear their frequent boast that they own eight millions of property. This is about 3% according to the last tax list, the total of which shows an amount much less than the actual total values of the state, but this fact does not disturb the proportion between the races. They are 30% of the population after 30 years of opportunity, they have 3% uh, of the property. True, they may claim that this is all net gains as they started with no property. But they did not start with nothing. They started with enormous advantages over whites. They were accustomed to labor. They, the whites, were not. They had been for generations the producers of the state and the whites the consumers. They were accustomed to hardship and privation and patient industry. They had the muscle. If in this 30 years they have only acquired this penance, where will they be in another 30 years considering that the advantages of their start are largely, if not entirely, lost? The homes and businesses of successful African Americans were sometimes torched by whites at night, but because black residents had enough economic and political power to defend their interests, socially things were relatively peaceful. 
the dynamics continued with the elections of 1894 and 1896 in which the Republican populist fusion ticket won every statewide office including the governorship in the latter election won by Daniel L. Russell. The fusionists began dismantling the Democrats' political infrastructure, namely by reverting their appointed positions in local offices back to offices subject to popular elections. They also began trying to dismantle the Democratic stronghold in the less populated western part of the state, which allowed Democrats more political power through gerrymandering. The fusionists also encouraged black citizens to vote, who constituted an estimated 120,000 Republican sympathizers. By 1898, Wilmington's key political power was in the hands of the Big Four, who were representative of the fusion ticket. The mayor, Dr. Silas P. Wright, the acting sheriff of New Hanover County, George Zadok French, the postmaster, W. H. Chadbourne, and businessman, Flavio W. Fosters, who wielded substantial support and influence with black voters. The big four worked in concert with a circle of patrons made up of about 2,000 black voters and about 150 whites, known as the ring. The ring included about 20 prominent businessmen, about six first and second generation New Englanders from families that had settled in the Cape Fear region before the war. An influential black family such as the Sampsons and the Howes, the ring wielded political power using patronage, monetary support, and an effective press through the Wilmington Post and the Daily Record. This shift in consolidation of power horrified white Democrats who contested the new laws, taking their grievances to the state Supreme Court, which did not rule in their favor. Defeated at the polls and in the courtroom, the Democrats, thus desperate to avoid another loss, became aware of discord between the fusion alliance of black republicans and white populists although it appeared that the fusionists would sweep the upcoming elections in 1898 if voters voted on the following issues the economic issues of which the fusion coalition built its alliance on included free coinage currency reform was an emotional issue and the fusionists built a pragmatic political coalition around it the u.s coinage act of 1834 had increased the silver to gold weight ratio from a 1792 level of 15 to 1 to 16 to 1 which brought the minting price for silver below its international market price a move favorable to holders of silver bullion in 1873 due to a change in market dynamics and currency circulation the treasury revised the law abolishing the right of the holders of the silver bullion to have their metal struck into their fully legal tender dollar coin ending by bimetallism in the United States and placing the nation firmly on the gold standard. Because of this, the act became contentious in later years and was denounced by people who wanted inflation as the crime of 73. The appearance of the revision was that it hurt poor people as silver was known as the poor man's money given its use and circulation among the poor. While state populist leadership believed its party was more ideologically aligned with the Democrats, some populists refused to align with a party that did not support the increased corners of silver. The second point reads, 1868 North Carolina Railroad Bond Scandal. Since before the American Civil War, the state had been trying to expand the Western North Carolina Railroad, which was incorporated in 1855. The railroad was supposed to link Asheville to both Paint Rock, Alabama, and Ducktown, Tennessee saw its construction stalled at Henry Station, a few miles from Old Fort, around 1872, plagued with construction problems in the Blue Ridge Mountains. The railroad became insolvent due to the unfunding misappropriation of bonds and poor management. The state purchased the railroad in June 1875 for $825,000. However, the purchase also made the state liable for the railroad's nearly $45 million in debt, a substantial amount of that due to fraud because in 1868, two men had defrauded the state legislature into issuing bonds for the railroad's western expansion. Controversy mounted when Zebulon Vance was re-elected as governor in 1877 and made the railroad's completion a personal crusade. Vance had an inherent conflict of interest in supporting the railroad as his family were major landholders in the area around Asheville where the railroad would pass through. Additionally, although Vance publicly decreed that the original bondholders would still owe money by the state, paying them would further cost the financially strapped state, which would only further delay the construction of the railroad. Possibly because of this, Vance never took any action to resolve the crisis during the rest of his governorship, leaving many bondholders straddled with the debt of the state. 
Vance later left office to become a U.S. senator and after the railroad was completed using leased convict labor, he negotiated a sale of the railroad to a private company. After Vance left, the state issued a complete settlement of less than 15% of the roughly $45 million in bond, leaving bondholders upset. Democrats blamed the Republicans for the mishap as they held legislative power when it happened. However, fusionists associated railroads with the capital's greed of Democrats. In addition, many of the Democrats blaming Republicans had voted to authorize the bond, notably Tom Jarvis. The third point reads debt relief. Whites and blacks had differing experiences with debt after the American Civil War. For whites, before the war, being in debt invoked undertones of personal moral failings. However, after the war, the fact that most Southern whites were in debt created a sense of community. That community banded together to push for political and economic reforms and negotiate favorable interest rates. Conversely, black people deemed debt another form of slavery, one that was immoral and sought to avoid it. They were often subject to high non-negotiable interest rates, recognizing that poor whites who advocated doing away with credit systems altogether in favor of pure cash system had an incentive to keep debt low and that poor black people were less than were well off than poor whites. Fusionists sought a platform to align their interests. By 1892, poor whites were incensed at Zebulon, Vance, and the Democrats who helped pledge to stand with the Farmers Alliance, a precursor to the Populist Party, on the issue of debt but had failed to do anything about the issue. In July 1890, Eugene Bedingfield, an influential member of the North Carolina State Farmers Alliance, warned Vance about the extent of their anger, saying, the people are very restless. We are on the verge of a revolution. God grant it may be bloodless. You cannot stand before the tide if it turns in your direction. No living power can withstand it. With 90% of the North Carolinians in debt, the fusionist platform restricted interest rates to 6%. In 1895, once in office, the fusionists successfully passed the measure with about 95% of black Republicans and white populists supporting it. However, 86% of Democrats who accounted for most of the lending class opposed it. In late 1897, nine prominent Wilmington men were unhappy with what they called Negro rule. They were particularly aggrieved about fusion government reforms that affected their ability to manage and game or such as to fix their advantage, the city affairs. Interest rates were lowered, which decreased banking revenue. Tax laws were adjusted, directly affecting stockholders and property owners who now had to pay like a proportion of taxes on the property they own. Railroad regulations were tightened, making it more difficult for those who had railroad holdings to capitalize on them. Wilmington Democrats thought these reforms were directed at them, the city's economic leaders. These men, the Secret Nine, Hugh McRae, J. Allen Taylor, Hardy L. Fennell, W. A. Johnson, L. B. Sasser, William Gilchrist, P. B. Manning, E. S. Lathrop, and Walter L. Parsley, banded together and began conspiring to retake control of the government. Around the same time, the newly elected Democratic Par State Party Chairman, Fernifold Simmons was tasked with developing a strategy for the Democrats' 1898 campaign. Simmons knew that in order to win, he needed an issue that would cut across party lines. A student of Southern political history, he knew that racial resentment was easy to inflame. He would later admit he had taken notice when, in the previous year, popular Senator Marion Butler wrote in his newspaper, The Caucasian. There is but one chance and but one hope for the railroads to capture the net le legislature, and that is for the nigger to be made the issue. Simmons then decided to build a campaign around the issue of white supremacy, knowing that the question would overwhelm all other issues. He began working with the Secret Nine, who volunteered to use their connections and funds to advance his efforts. He developed a strategy to recruit men who could write, speak, and ride, writers were those who could create propaganda in the media, speakers were those who would be powerful orators and writers were those who could ride a horse and be intimidating. He also had Tom Jarvis relay a message, I mean a promise, to the large corporation. If the Democrats won, the party would not raise their taxes. In March 1898, after realizing the Raleigh-based News and Observer and the Charlotte Observer, which represented both the liberal and conservative wings in the Democratic Party, were together in the, in the same bed shouting nigger, Simmons met with jo Josephus, Jody, 
Daniels, the editor of the News and Observer, who also had the 21-year-old cartoonist Norman Jennett, nicknamed Samson Huckleberry, on staff in with Charles Acock. The men met at the Chautauqua Hotel in New Bern and began planning on how to execute the Democratic campaign strategy. Simmons began by recruiting media outlets sympathetic to white supremacy such as the Caucasian and the Progressive Farmer which cynically called the populace the white man's party while touting the party's alliance with black people. He also recruited aggressive, dynamic, and militant young white supremacists to help his effort. These publications presented black people as being insolent, accused them of exhibiting ill will and disrespect for whites in public, labeled them as corrupt and unjust, constantly laid claims about black men's alleged interest in white women, and accused white fusionists aligned with allied with them of supporting Negro domination. Simmons summarized the party's platform when he stated, North Carolina is a white man's state and white men will rule it and they will crush the party of Negro domination beneath a majority so overwhelming that no other party will ever dare to attempt to establish Negro rule here. Party leader Daniel Schneck added, it will be the meanest, vilest, dirtiest campaign since 1876. The slogan of the Democratic Party from the mountains to the sea will be but one word, nigger. On November 20th, 1897, following a Democratic Executive Committee meeting in Raleigh, the first statewide call for white unity was issued. Written by Francis D. Winston, it called on whites to unite and reestablish Anglo-Saxon rule and honest government in North Carolina. He called Republican and populist rule anarchy evil and apocalyptic, setting a vision for the Democrats to be the saviors, the redeemers that would rescue the state from tyranny. Simmons created a, speak, a speaker's bureau, stacking it with talented orators whom he could deploy to deliver the message across the state. One of those orators was Alfred Moore Waddell an aging member of the Wilmington's upper class who was a skilled speaker and four-time former congressman losing his seat to Daniel L. Russell in 1878. Waddell remained active after his defeat, becoming a highly sought-after political speaker and campaigner. He positioned himself as a representative of oppressed whites and a symbol of redemption for inflamed white voters. He had developed a reputation as the silver tongue orator of the East and as an American robe aspire. In 1898, Waddell, who was unemployed at the time, was also dealing with financial difficulty. His law practice was struggling, and his third wife, Gabrielle, largely supported him through her music teaching. The chief of police, John Melton, later testified that Waddell was seeking opportunity to return to prominence as a politician in order to lighten the burden of his wife. Waddell aligned with the Democrats in their campaign to redeem North Carolina from Negro domination. Melton stated that Waddell, who had been out of public life for a while, saw the white supremacy campaign as his opportunity to put himself before the people and pose as a patriot, thereby getting to the feed, through, feed trial. Waddell was hired to attend elections and see that men voted correctly. With the aid of Daniels, who would distribute racist propaganda that he later acknowledged helped fuel a reign of terror, i.e. disparaging cartoons of blacks, before speeches, Waddell and the other orators began appealing to white men to join their cause. As fall of, the 1898, of 1898 approached, prominent Democrats such as George Roundtree, Francis Winston, and attorneys William B. McCoy, Iridel Mirez, and John D. Bellamy began organizing white supremacy clubs known as the white government union the clubs demanded that every white man in wilmington join many good people were marched from their homes taken to headquarters and told to sign those that did not were notified that they must leave the city as there was plenty of rope in the city and that came from wilmington Arm alderman benjamin f keith membership in the clubs began spreading throughout the state the clubs were complemented by the development of a white labor movement created to oppose blacks competing with whites for jobs. The White Laborers Union got the backing of the Wilmington Chamber of Commerce and Merchants Association and vowed to create a permanent labor bureau for the purpose of procuring white labor for employers. The efforts of the white supremacists finally consolidated in August 1898 when Alexander Manley, owner of Wilmington's only black newspaper, The Daily Record, wrote an editorial responding to a speech supporting lynchings by printing that many white women were not raped by black men, but willingly slept with them. Manley was the acknowledged grandson of Governor Charles Manley and his slave Corinne. 
Whites were outraged at Manley's peace. This provided an opening for Democrats now calling themselves the white man's party as evidence supporting their claims of predatory and emboldened blacks. For some time, Joseph Daniels had used Wilmington as a symbol of Negro domination because its government was biracial, ignoring the fact that it was dominated by two thirds white majority. Many newspapers published pictures and stories implying that African American men were sexually attacking white women in the city. This belief was championed throughout the country following a speech by Rebecca Latimer Felton, a prominent women's suffragist and wife of Georgia populist William F. William H. Felton at the Georgia Agricultural Society. She claimed that out of, of all the threats that farm wives faced, none was greater than the black rapists due to the failure of white men to protect them and said that in order to restore that protection, white men should resort to vigilante justice. When there is not enough religion in the pulpit to organize a crusade against sin, nor justice in the courthouse to promptly punish crime, nor manhood enough in the nation to put a sheltering arm about innocence and virtue, if it needs lynching to protect woman's dearest possessions from the ravening beast, ravening human beast, then I say lynch a thousand times a week if necessary, and that came from Mrs. W. Mrs. W. H. Felton, August 11th, 1897. In response to Felton's speech and the danger it imposed upon black men, 32-year-old Alexander Manley wrote an editorial refuting it and asserting that white women have consensual sex with black men. Fearing that the piece would provoke backlash, five prominent black Wilmington Republicans, W. E. Henderson, who was a lawyer, Charles Norwood, who was a register of deeds, Elijah Green, who was an alderman, Johnny Taylor, who was a deputy, deputy collector of customs, and John C. Dancy, who was a collector of customs, urged Manley to suspend the paper. However, many whites were appalled at the suggestion of consensual sex between black men and white women. Within 48 hours, white supremacists aided by newspapers across the South used Manley's words though reprinting incendiary distortions of them as a championing catalyst for their cause. Waddell and other orators began inciting white citizens with sexualized images of black men, insinuating black men's uncontrollable lust for white women, running newspaper stories and delivering speeches of black beasts who threatened to deflower white women. Following the coup, Felton would later say this of Manly. When the Negro Manly attributed the crime of rape to lewd intimacy between negro men and white women of the south the slanderer should be made to fear a lynchers rope rather than occupy a place in newspapers prior to this editorial the, da the daily record had been considered a very credible creditable colored paper throughout the state that had attracted subscriptions and advertising from blacks and whites alike however after the editorial white advertisers withdrew their support from the paper crippling its income Manley's landlord, M.J. Heyer, then evicted him. For his own safety, Manley was forced to relocate his press in the middle of the night. He and supporters moved his entire press from the corner of, Walt of Water Street and Princess Street to a frame building on 7th Street between Ann and Nunn. He had planned to move to Love and Charity Hall, a.k.a. Ruth Hall, a South 7th Street, but it declined to take him as a tenant because his presence would have greatly increased the building's insurance rate. Black pastors asked their congreg congregations to step in and purchase subscriptions to help keep Manley's newspaper solvent, which many black women agreed to do, as they deem Manley's paper to be the one medium that has stood up for our rights when others have forsaken us. John C. Dancy would later call Manley's editorial the determining factor of the riot, while Star News reporter Harry Hayden referred to it as the straw that broke Mr. Nigger's political back. On October 20th, 1898, in Fayetteville, the Democrats staged their largest political rally. The Red Shirts made their North Carolina debut with 300 of them accompanying 22 virtuous young white ladies in a parade where cannons were fired and a brass band played. A guest of honor was South Carolina Senator Ben Tillman, who chastised the white men of North Carolina for not yet killing that damn nigger editor, editor they're talking about Manly bragging that Manley would be dead if his editorial had been published in South Carolina and when it came to blacks advocating a shotgun policy. Four days later, 50 of the city's most prominent white men such as Robert Glenn, Thomas Jarvis, Cameron Morrison, and Charles Acock, who was now the preeminent orator of the campaign, packed the, the Italian Hall House, Opera House. 
Alfred Waddell would deliver a speech declaring that white supremacy was the only issue of importance for white men. He deemed blacks to be ignorant and railed that the greatest crime that has ever been perpetuated against modern civilization was the investment of the Negro with the right of suffrage. And he advocated punishment for race traitors for enabling it, cementing his call with a blistering closing. We will never surrender to a raffled, a ragged raffle of Negroes, even if we have to choke the Cape Fear River with carcasses. Waddell's closing became a rallying cry for white men and women alike. This I do not believe for a moment that they will submit any longer. It is time for the oft quoted shotgun to play a part in an active one in the elections. We applaud to the echo of your determination that our old historic river should be choked with the bodies of our enemies, white and black, but what his state shall be redeemed. It has reached the point where bloodletting need for the health of the commonwealth and when it commences, let it be thorough. Solomon says there is a time to kill. That time seems to have to come, so get, so get to work. You go for it to work your bloody, though it may be, with heartfelt approval of many good women in the state, we say amen. And that came from Rebecca Cameron on October 26, 1898. Portions of Waddell's speech were printed, sent around the state, and quoted by speakers on every stump. After the Tallinn Hall speech on October 28, special trains from Wilmington provided discounted train tickets to Waddell and other white men to travel across the state to Goldsboro for a white supremacy convention. A crowd of 8,000 showed up to hear Waddell share the stage with Simmons, Charles Acock, Tom, Thomas Jarvis, and Major William A. Guthrie and the mayor of Durham. Proceeding Waddell on the stage, Guthrie declared, the Anglo-Saxon planted civilization on this continent and wherever this race has been in conflict with another race it has asserted its supremacy and either conquered or exterminated the foe this great race has carried the bible in one hand and the sword in the other resist our march of progress and civilization and we will wipe you off of the face of the earth Waddell followed by accusing blacks of insolence and arrogance, which he claimed was overshadowed by only by their criminality. He insinuated, he insinuated that black men were disrespectful to white women and blamed the evils of Negro rule on the white men who had empowered them by betraying their race. Once again, he concluded his speech assuring that them that assuring them that white men would banish blacks and their traitors white allies even if they had to fill the cape fear river with enough black dead bodies to block its passage to the sea waddell's speech so inspired the crowd that the red shirts left the convention and started terrorizing black citizens and their white allies in the eastern part of the state right away they destroyed property ambushed citizens with weapon fire and kidnapped people from their homes and whipped them at night with the goal of terrorizing them to the point where Republican sympathizers would be too afraid to vote or even register to do so. The populace accused the Democrats of crying nigger to distract from the issues and of attacking the character of good men in order to get elected to office. Several populists began trying to fight back in the court of public opinion like Oliver Dockery, who was attacked by John Bellamy at the white supremacy conviction. You may abuse me if you like, but I want to tell you that you will never make a duck. I cannot close without referring to my opponent as he has seen fit to attack me. On the night before the canvassing board met, Soul Wheel chartered a boat and at that hour of midnight went to Southport where convened the canvassing board, all of whom were Democrats, and made the arrangements to throw out the entire populist vote of this county on the ground that the ballots were not on white enough paper and the votes were thrown out. Now Bellamy asked Populous to save him. The man who would steal a man's vote is a pig. Democrats will not let the Negro vote. This should prompt you colored people to stand together with the Populous and your other white friends until we fasten this honest election law on the state forever. Can there be a more diabolical scheme than this latest plan of monopoly? What thinks ye laborers? Are you ready to march into the trap? Are you ready to surrender your liberties? Can the hypocrite leaders be anything else except tools or fools? Are you ready to follow them? Progressive farmer, when you go to town, be tempted. They set you up at the dinner table, give you a drink, call you a good fellow, to be good in the fusion crowds, and in a hundred other ways they will tempt you to tall down and worship Simmons Ransom Goldbug Machine. 
The Democrats and Tar Heel them are straining their lungs and using all of the big type in the printing of farce to prove that Negro domination is what matters in the North Carolina, but it won't work all together. We're in Negro domination responsible for the Democratic judges who have sat on the bench in recent years in a state of beastly intoxication and sentenced innocent men to the penitentiary and allowed rogues and murders to go free. Wherein was Negro domination responsible for the lease of the Southern Railway of the North Carolina property which has been denounced as a midnight crime? Wherein is Negro domination responsible for the existence of one of the greatest trusts of the century which has impoverished the entire state? Who has been responsible for the shameless record of theft and plunder at the state's capital where the legislature was solidly democratic? It was because of the infamous proceedings of democratic misrule and pillage that the populist party was born. From the ranks of democracy came every mother's son of the many thousands of populists who are righteous in wrath against conspirators masquerading as untrammeled democracy. That is the truth of the whole sorry business, and whenever the Democratic Party will purge itself, when it will shake off the bloodsuckers and leeches which have disfigured and disgraced it. There are thousands who will return to its folds until that glad day comes. The Democrats must do something else besides cry, Negro domination. And that was from Oliver Dockery, dated September 9, 1898. However, the Democrats continue to put more pressure on Republican pop and populists, leading the candidates being too afraid to speak in Wilmington. Democrats sought to further capitalize on this fear by making efforts to suppress the Republican ticket in New Hanover County, arguing that a win by any political party opposing the Democrats would guarantee a race riot. They convinced the business community of this outcome. The election threatens to provoke a war between the black and white races that will precipitate a conflict which may cause hundreds and perhaps thousands of lives and the partial of in or entire destruction of the city. We declare to you our conviction that we are on the brink of a revolution which can only be averted by the suppression of a Republican ticket. And that was a message from James Sprunt to Governor Daniel Russell on October 24th, 1898. The red shirts known to be hot-headed were looked down upon by the Wilmington white elite as ruffians and low class. However, they deployed the red shirts around the city who began holding a series of marches and rallies organized by an unemployed sympathizer, Mike Dowling, an Irishman who, despite being elected the chair of the white laborers union, had recently been fired as the foreman of the fire engine company number two for incompetency, drunkenness, and continued insubordination. On November 1st, 1898, Dowling led a parade of 1,000 men mounted on horses for 10 miles through the black neighborhoods, i.e. Brooklyn of Wilmington. Joining his red shirts were the new Han Hanover County horsemen and former members of the disbanded Rough Riders led by Theodore Swan. White women waved flags and handkerchiefs as they passed. The procession ended at the First National Bank building, which served as the Democratic Party headquarters, where they were encouraged by Democratic politicians in front of big crowds. The next day, Dowling led a white man's rally. Every able-bodied white man was armed. Escorted by Chief Marshal Roger Moore, a parade of men began downtown, again marched through the black neighborhoods, firing into black homes and a black school on Campbell Square and ended at Hilton Park where a thousand people greeted them with a picnic and a free barbecue. A number of defiant speakers followed. For example, future U.S. Representative Claude Kitchen said, all the soldiers in the United States will not keep white people from enjoying their rights. And if a Negro constable comes to a white man with a warrant in his hand, he should leave with a bullet in his brain. Leading up to the election, these gatherings became daily occurrences. The white newspapers announced the time and place of meetings, free food and liquor were provided for the vigilantes in order to fire them up and make them fiercer and more terrorizing in their conduct. At night, the rallies took on a carnival-like atmosphere. However, away from the streets, the groups began disrupting black churches and patrolling the streets as white citizen patrols, wearing a white handkerchief tied around their arms, intimidating and attacking black citizens. The patrons of the white supremacy campaign also supplied them with a new U.S. $1,200 equivalent to $39,086 in 2021. The atmosphere in the city made blacks anxious and tense. Conversely, it made whites hysterical and paranoid. A number of black men attempted to purchase guns and powder as was legal, but the gun merchants who were all white refused to sell them any. 
the merchants reported to the clubs of any black person who tried to procure arms. Some blacks tried to circumvent the local merchants by purchasing guns from outside of the state, such as from the Winchester Repeating Arms Company. However, the manufacturer would refer the request back to their North Carolina state branch, which would then call the order of the local Wilmington branch. Once the state branch learned from the local branch that the purchases were black, the state branch would refuse to fill the order. Merchants sold no guns to blacks between November 1st and 10th, but later testified that they sold over 400 guns to whites over the same period. The only weapons blacks had were a few old army muskets and pistols. Newspapers incited people into believing that confrontation was inevitable. Rumors began to spread that blacks were purchasing guns and ammunition readying themselves for a confrontation. Whites began to suspect black leaders were conspiring in churches, making revolutionary speeches and pleading with the community to arm themselves with bullets or to create torches from kerosene and stolen white cotton bales. Alderman Benjamin Keith wrote, Readers were believing everything that was printed, as well as news that was circulated and peddled on the streets. The frenzied excitement went on, to, on until everyone but those who were behind the plot, with a few exceptions, were led to believe that the Negroes were going to rise up and kill all the whites. The political director of the Washington Post, Henry L. West, went to Wilmington to cover the white supremacy campaign. He wrote, In Wilmington, I found a very remarkable condition of affairs. The city might have been preparing for a siege instead of an election. All shades of political beliefs were represented, but in the presence of what they believed to be an overwhelming crisis, they brushed aside the great principles that divide parties and individuals and stood together as one man. When I emphasized the fact that every block and every ward was thus organized, and that the precautionary meetings were attended by ministers, lawyers, doctors, merchants, railroad officials, cotton explorers, and indeed the reputable tax-paying substantial men of the city, the extent and significance of this armed movement can perhaps be realized. It was not the wild and freakish organization of irresponsible men, but the deliberate action of determined citizens, military preparation so extensive as to suggest assault from some foreign foe must have had unusual inspiration and definite purpose. The fiat had gone forth, and it was expected that the Negroes, when they learned that the right of suffrage was to be denied them, would resist. From their churches and their lodges had come reports of incendiary speeches of impassioned appeals to the blacks to use the bullet that had no respect for color, and the kerosene and torch that would play havoc in the white man's cotton and bale and warehouse. It was this fear of the Negro uprising in defense of his electorate of a forcible and revengeful retaliation that offered an ostensible ground for the general displays of arms. But if the truth be told, the reason thus offered was a little more of a fortunate excuse. The whites had determined to regain their white supremacy and the wholesale armament was intended to convey to the blacks in earnest of this decision. There would have been rapid fire guns and Winchester rifles if every church had held a silent pulpit and every lodge room where the Negroes met had been empty. White supremacy, therefore, was the magnet that attracted to tie the bound that one overwhelming force that dominated everything. The Democrats hired two detectives to investigate the rumors, including one black detective. However, the detectives concluded that the black residents were doing practically nothing. George Roundtree would later write that the two other black detectives claimed that black women agreed to set fire to their employer's home and that black men threatened to burn Wilmington down if the white supremacists prevailed in the election. To prevent any black conspiring, the Democrats forbade blacks from congregating anywhere. Right before the election, the red shirts supported the white government union were told that they wanted Democrats to win the election at all hazards and by any means necessary. And even if they had to shoot every Negro in the city, the red shirts had so instituted a level of fear among the city's blacks that approaching the election that they were in a state of terror amounting almost to distress. The day before the election, Waddell ex excited a large crowd at Italian Hall when he told them, you are Anglo-Saxon, you are armed and prepared, and you will do your duty. Go to the polls tomorrow, and if you find the Negro out voting, tell him to leave the polls, and if he refuses, kill him. Shoot him down in his tracks. We shall win tomorrow if we have to do it with guns. Most blacks and many Republicans did not vote in the November 8th election, hoping to avoid violence as red shirts had blocked every road leading in and out of the city and drove potential black voters away with gunfire. 
The red shirts were in line with Congressman W. W. Kitchen, who declared, before we allow the Negroes to control the state as they do now, we will kill enough of them that there will not be enough left to bury them. Governor Russell, who by this point had withdrawn his name from the ballot in the county, decided to come to Wilmington as it was his hometown, and he thought he might be able to calm the situation. However, when his train arrived, Red Shirt swarmed his train car and tried to lynch him. When the day was over, Democrats won 6,000 votes overall, and was, which was sizable given that the Fusion Party won 5,000 votes just two years prior. However, years later, it was determined that the 11,000 vote net increase also strongly suggested a high degree of election fraud. Mike Dallin would support this suggestion when he testified that Democrat Party officials worked with the red shirts instructing them where to deposit Republican ballots so they could be replaced by votes for Democrats. The political director of the Washington Post, who was in Wilmington for the election, recounted, no one for a moment supposes that this was the result of a free and untrammeled ballot. And a Democratic victory here, as in other parts of the state, was largely a result of suppression of the Negro vote. However, the biracial fusionist government still remained in power in Wilmington because the mayor and board of aldermen had not been up for re-election in 1898. The night following the election, Democrats ordered white men to patrol the streets expecting blacks to retaliate. However, no retaliation occurred. All the abuse which has been vented upon them for months, they have gone quietly on and have been almost polite as if to ward off the persecution they seem involuntarily to have felt to be in the air. In spite of all the goading and persecuting that has been done all summer, the Negroes have done nothing that could call vengeance on their heads. I awoke that next morning with thankful heart that the election had passed without the shedding of blood of either the innocent or the guilty. I heard the colored people going by to their work talking cheerfully together as they had not been that case for many days now. That came from Jane Cronley, Wilmington resident in 1898. It was the perfect farce to be out there in the damp and cold watching for poor, cowed, disarmed Negroes, frightened to death by the threats they had been made against them, and too glad to be huddled in their homes and keep quiet. That came from Michael Cronley, Wilmington resident of 1898. The Secret Nine had charged Alfred Waddell's committee of 25 with directing the execution of the provisions of the resolutions within a document that they authored that called for the removal of voting rights for blacks and for the overthrow of the newly elected interracial government. The document was called the White Declaration of Independence. According to the Wilmington Messenger, the committee of 25 included Hugh McRae, J James Ellis, Reverend J.W. Kramer, Frank Maunder, F.P. Skinner, C.L. Spencer, J. Allen Taylor, E.S. Lathrop, F. H. Fetchtig, W.H. Norton, Norton Sr., A.B. Skelding, F.A. Montgomery, B.F. King, Reverend J.W.S. Harvey, Joseph R. Davis, Dr. W.C. Galloway, Joseph D. Smith, John E. Crow, F.H. Stedman, Gabe Holmes, Junius Davis, Iridell Mears, P. L. Bridges, W. F. Robertson, and C. W. Worth. On election day, Hugh McRae of the Secret Nine had the Wilmington Messenger call for a mass meeting. That evening, the paper published attention white men telling all white men to meet at the courthouse the following morning for important business. On the morning of November 9th, the courthouse was packed with 600 men of all professions and economic classes. Hugh McRae sat in front of with the former mayor of M Mayor S. H. Fishblatt and other prominent white Democrats. When Alfred Waddell arrived, McRae provided him a copy of the White Declaration of Independence, which Waddell read to the crowd, asserting the supremacy of the white man. He proclaimed that the U.S. Constitution did not anticipate the enfranchisement of an ignorant population of African origin, that never again will white men of New Hanover County permit black political participation, that the Negro should stop antagonizing our interests in every way, especially by his ballot, and that the city should give to white men a large part of the employment heretofore given to Negroes. The full text of the declaration is as follows. Believing that the Constitution of the United States contemplated a government to be carried out, carried on by an enlightened people, believing that its framers did not anticipate the enfranchisement of an ignorant population of African origin, and believing that those men of the state of North Carolina who did join in the framing of the Union did not contemplate for their descendants subject, subjection to an inferior race. 
We, the undersigned citizens of the city of Wilmington and county of New Hanover, do hereby declare that we will no longer be ruled and will never be ruled again by men of African origin. This condition we have in part endured because we felt that the consequences of the war of secession were such as deprived us to the fair consideration of many of our countrymen. While we recognize the authority of the United States and will yield to it if exerted, we would not for a moment believe that it is the purpose of 60 million of our own race to subject us permanently to a fate to which no Anglo-Saxon has ever been forced to submit. We therefore believing that we represent unequivocally the sentiments of the white people of this country and city hereby for ourselves and as representatives of them proclaim that the time has come for the intelligent citizens of this community owning 95% of the property and paying taxes in proportion to end the rule by Negroes, that we will not tolerate the action of unscrupulous white men in affiliating with the Negroes so that by means of their vote, they can dominate the intelligence and thrifty elements in the community, thus causing business to stagnate and progress to be out of the question. That the Negro has demonstrated by antagonizing our interests in every way and especially by his ballot that he is incapable of realizing that his interests are and should be identical with those of the community that the progressive element in any community is the white population and that giving of all nearly all the employment to negro laborers has been against the best interests of this county and city and a sufficient reason why the city of wilmington with its natural advantages has not become a city of at least fifty thousand inhabitants that we propose in future to give to white men a large part of the employment heretofore given to Negroes because we realize that white families cannot thrive here unless there are more opportunities for employment of the different members of their families. That we white men expect to live in this community peaceably and to have and provide absolute protection for our families who shall be safe from insults or injuries from all persons whomsoever. We are prepared to treat the Negroes with justice in all matters which do not involve sacrifice of the intelligent and progressive portion of the community, but are equally prepared now and immediately to enforce what we know to be our rights. That we have been in our desire for harmony and peace blinded both to our interests and our rights. A climax was reached when the Negro paper of the city published an article so vile and slanderous that it would in most communities have resulted in a lynching. And yet there is no punishment provided by the courts adequate for the offense. We therefore owe it to the people of this community and city as protection against such license in the future that the record be cease to be published and that its editor be banished from this community. We demand that he leave the city forever within 24 hours after the issuance of this proclamation second that the printing press from which the record has been issued be shipped from the city without delay that we be notified within 12 hours of the acceptance or rejection of this demand. If the demand is agreed to, we counsel forbearance on the part of the white men. If the demand is refused or no answer is given within the time mentioned, then the editor Manley will be expelled by force. The crowd gave Waddell a standing ovation and 457 signed their names to adopt the proclamation, which would be published in the newspapers without concealing who they were. The group then decided to give the city's black residents 12 hours to comply with it. Alexander Manley had already shut his press down and left town when he was alerted by a white friend that the red shirts were going to lynch him that night. Manley's friends gave him $25 and told him a password to bypass white guards on Fulton Bridge as bands of red shirts were patrolling the banks, trains, and steamboats. Once Manley, along with his brother Frank and two other fair-skinned black men, Jim Telfane and Owen Bailey approached the guards after escaping through the woods. The guards let them pass. The guards, believing the four men to be white, also invited them to the necktie party they were going to that evening for that scoundrel Manley. The guards even loaded their buggies with Winchester rifles in case they spotted Manley on their way out of the city. Waddell's committee of 25 summoned the Committee of Colored Citizens, or the Triple C, a group of 32 prominent black citizens to the courthouse at 6 p.m. They told the CCC of their ultimatum, instructing them to direct the rest of the city's black citizens to fall in line. When the black men asked to reason with them and pleaded that they could not control what Manley did or what any other black person would do, Waddell responded that they had 
that the time had passed for their words. The black men left the courthouse and went to David Jacobs Barbershop on Dock Street, where they wrote a reply to the committee's ultimatum. We, the colored citizens to whom was referred the matter of expulsion from the community, are the persons in press of A.L. Manley beg most respectfully to say that we are in no way responsible nor in any way condone the obnoxious article that called forth your actions. Neither are we authorized to act for him in this manner, but in the interest of peace we will most willingly use our influence to have your wishes carried out. Lawyer Armand Scott wrote the letter was instructed by the committee to personally deliver the response to Waddell's home at 5th and Princess Streets by 7.30 a.m. the next day, November 10th. Scott was afraid and left the response in Waddell's mailbox. Scott later claimed that the letter Waddell had published in newspaper was not the letter he wrote. He said that the letter he authored expressed that Manley had ended the publication of the Daily Record two weeks before the election, thereby eliminating the alleged bias between, of a conflict between the races. Alfred Waddell and the Committee of 25 purportedly did not receive a response from the Wilmington Committee of Colored Citizens by 7.30 a.m. on November 10th, though it, was, uh, it is unclear when Waddell checked his mailbox. As a result, about 45 minutes later, Waddell gathered about 500 white businessmen and veterans at Wilmington's Armory. After heavily arming themselves with rifles and a Gatling gun, Waddell then led the group to the two-story publishing office of the Daily Record, the city's black-owned newspaper, they broke into editor Alexander Manley's building, vandalized the premises, doused the wood floors with kerosene, and set the building on fire, and gutted the remains. At the same time, black newspapers all over the state were also being destroyed. In addition, blacks, along with the white Republicans, were denied interest to city centers throughout the state. Following the fire, the mob of white vigilantes swelled to about 2,000 men. A rumor circulated that some black people had fired a on a small group of white men a mile away from the printing office. White men then went into black Wilmington neighborhoods, destroying the black businesses and property and assaulting black inhabitants with the mentality of kill every damn nigger in sight. As Waddell led a group to disband the drive out of the elected government of the city, the white mob rioted. Armed with shotguns, the mob attacked black people throughout Wilmington and primarily in Brooklyn, the majority black neighborhood. The small patrols were spread out over the city and continued until nightfall. Walker Taylor was authorized by Governor Russell to command the Wilmington Light Infantry Troops, just returned from the Spanish-American War, and the Federal Naval Reserves taking them into Brooklyn to quell the riot. They intimidated both black and white crowds with rapid fire weapons, shooting and killing several black men. Hundreds of black people fled the town to take shelter in nearby swamps. As the violence spread, Waddell led a group to the Republican Mayor Silas P. Wright. Waddell forced Wright, the Board of Aldermen, and the police chief to resign at gunpoint. The mob installed a, city, a new city council that elected Waddell to take over as mayor by 4 p.m. that day. Once he was declared mayor, the Secret Nine gave Waddell a list of prominent Republicans who, was, who he was to banish from the city. The next morning, Waddell, flanked by George L. Martin and the Wilmington Light Infantry, marched six prominent black people on the list out of Wilmington. The other black people on the list had already fled. Waddell put them on a train headed north in a special car armed with guards who were instructed to take them over the state line. Waddell then gathered the whites on the list and paraded them in front of a large crowd, allowing GZ French to be dragged on the ground and nearly lynched from a telephone pole before he was allowed to board the train and leave the city. The coup was deemed a success for the business elite, with the Charlotte Observer quoting a prominent lawyer who said, The businessmen of the state are largely responsible for the victory. We have tried to win the populace back by coaxing. In doing this, we have insulted some of the best businessmen in the state, but not so this year. Not before in years have the bank men, the mill men, and the businessmen in general, the backbone of the property interests of the state taken in such sincere interest. They work from start to finish, and furthermore, they spend large bits of money on behalf of the cause. For several years, this class of men have been almost ignored. The number of black people killed by the mob by the end of the day, which was November 10th, is uncertain. Estimates have included about 20, more than 20, 20 or more, somewhere between 14 and 60, as many as 60, at least 60, 90, more than 100, and exceeding 300. 
An additional number variously estimated between 20 and 50 were banished in order to leave town by the mob. The Reverend J. Allen Kirk gave this statement about the experience. It was a great sight to see them marching from death and colored women, colored men, colored children, colored enterprises and colored people all exposed to death. Firing began and it seemed like a mighty battle in wartime. The shrieks and screams of children, of mothers, of wives were heard, such as caused the blood of the most inhuman person to creep. Thousands of women, children, and men rushed the swamps and lay there upon the earth in the cold to freeze and starve. The woods were filled with colored people. The streets dotted with the dead bodies. A white gentleman said that he saw ten bodies lying in the undertaker's office at the time. At one time, some of their bodies were left lying in the streets up until the next day following the riot. Some were found by the stench and miasma that came forth from the decaying bodies under their houses. Every colored man who passed through the streets had either to be guarded by one of the crowd or have a paper pass given him the right to pass. All colored men at the cotton press and oil mills were ordered not to leave their labor but stop there. While their wives and children were shrieking and crying in the midst of the flying balls and in the sight of the cannons and gatling guns. All the white people had gone out of that part of the city. This army of men marched through the streets and sword buckled to their sides, giving the command to fire. Men stood at their labors, wringing their hands and weeping, but they dared not move to the protection of their homes. And then when they passed through the streets, had to hold up their hands and be searched. The little white boys of the city searched them and took them every means of defense. And if they resisted, they were shot down. The city was under military rule. No Negro was allowed to come into the city without being examined or without passing through with his boss for whom he labored. Colored women were examined and their hats taken off, which were made even under their clothing. Clothing. They went from house to house looking for Negroes that they considered offensive, took arms they had hidden, and killed them for at least expression of manhood. They gathered around colored homes, firing like great sportsmen firing at rabbits, in an open field, and when one would jump his man from 60 to 1 100 shots, would be turned loose upon him. His escape was impossible. One fellow was walking along a railroad and they shot him down without any provocation. It is said by an eyewitness that men lay upon the street dead and dying while members of their race walked by helpless and unable to do to them any good or their families. Negro stores were closed and the owners thereof driven out of the city and even shipped away at the point of the gun. Some of the churches were searched for ammunition and cannons turned toward the door in the attitude of blowing up their church if the pastor or officers did not open them that they might go through. While African Americans sought redress for the attacks at the federal level, many also blamed Manley provo for provoking the attacks by pushing white, white supremacists too far. John C. Dancy stated in a November 21st New York Times interview that Manley was responsible for the attacks and that before his editorials or relations between blacks and whites were most cordial and amicable, but the white men of the South would not tolerate any reflection upon their women. Journalist and orator John Edward Bruce agreed and spoke out against Manley's attempts to revolutionize the social order. Even the National Afro-American Council called for a day of fasting for African Americans to offer a hearty confession of our own sins without condemning the role of the white supremacists in the attacks. Along with Alex and Frank G. Manley, brothers who had owned the Daily Record, more than 2,000 blacks left Wilmington permanently, forced to abandon their businesses and properties. This greatly reduced the city's professional and artisan class and changed the formerly black majority city into one with a white majority. While some whites were wounded, no whites were reported killed. City residents appeals to President William McKinley for help to recover from the widespread widespread destruction in Brooklyn received no response. The White House said it could not respond without a request from the governor and Governor Russell had not requested any help. In the 6th District, Oliver Dockery contested John Bellamy's congressional seat in court. However, he did not prevail. While the loss of blacks and the refusal to hire black workers benefited white labor movement in terms of job availability, white men were disappointed with the types of jobs that were available as they were quote unquote nigger jobs that paid quote-unquote nigger wages. Subsequent to Waddell's usurping power, he and his team were re-elected in March 1899 to city offices. Waddell held the mayorship in, until 1905. He wrote his memoirs in 1907 and died in 1912.
Once installed in the state legislature in 1899, Democrats who had accounted for nearly 53% of the vote determined there were two things that they could do to retain their power. The first one was prevent blacks from voting, and the second was normalize a racial hierarchy that allowed poor whites to feel empowered over and antagonistic toward blacks. To permanently install good government by the white man's party, the Secret Nine installed George Roundtree in the state legislature to ensure that blacks were kept from voting and also to keep white Republicans from aligning politically with blacks again. On January 6, 1899, Francis Winston introduced a suffrage bill to keep blacks from voting. Roundtree went on to chair a special joint committee overseeing the disenfranchisement am amendment, a committee that existed to circumvent the U.S. Constitution, which in fact granted blacks the rights to vote. The legislature passed a bill requiring new voters to pay a poll tax and passed a state constitutional amendment requiring prospective voters to demonstrate to local elected officials that they could read and write any section of the Constitution practices that discriminated against poor whites in more than 50,000 black men. However, to make sure that a few poor whites as possible would be heard by the law and prevented from voting Democrat, Roundtree invoked a grandfather clause. The clause guaranteed the right to register and vote, bypassing the literacy requirement if the voter or a voter's lineal ancestor was eligible to vote in his state of residence prior to January 1st, 1867. This excluded practically any black man from voting. Roundtree bragged of his work. The chief reason for my accepting the nomination in 98 or 1898 to the legislature was to see if I could do something to prevent a reoccurrence of the 1898 political upheaval by effecting a change in the suffrage law. I, as chairman, did all the work. The clause remained in effect until 1915 when the Supreme Court ruled it unconstitutional. After the coup, the Democrats began to pass the state's first racial hierarchy laws, prohibiting blacks and whites from sitting together on trains, steamboats, and in courtrooms, and even requiring blacks and whites to use separate Bibles. Nearly every aspect of public life was codified to separate poor whites and blacks. These laws, a direct result of the brief political alliance between blacks and poor whites, not only encouraged whites to see black people as outcasts and pariahs, but also rewarded them for doing so, socially and psychologically. This contributed to voluntary separation prior to the insurrection whites and blacks in Wilmington had lived close to one another, but over the following years, physical segregation increased between blacks and whites throughout the state, with home value, social status, and quality of life improving for whites the further they physically lived away from blacks. This served to lessen political democracy in the area and enhance the oligarchical rule of the descendants of the former slaveholding class. Through 1908, Democrats in other southern states began following North Carolina's example by suppressing the black vote through disenfranchisement laws or constitutional amendments of their own. They also passed laws mandating racial segregation of public facilities and martial law like impositions on African Americans. The U.S. Supreme Court at the time upheld such measures. Two years after the coup, the Democrats again ran on Negro domination with disenfranchisement of blacks on the ballot. Gubernatorial candidate Charles Aycock, one of the campaign's orders, used what happened at Wilmington as a warning to those who dared to challenge the Democrats. He stated the disenfranchisement would keep the peace when the votes in Wilmington were counted. Only 26 people voted against black disenfranchisement, demonstrating the political effect of the coup. And that is going to conclude this week's episode, which is episode 13 of the Black Massacre series. This, as you can tell, was a very, very lengthy piece of work right here. This is probably the longest one so far that I've done so far. And probably, honestly, most, most likely will probably be the longest. As you, can say, as you can tell, it took an hour before we actually got into the massacre part of the video, of the story itself because the lead up was so intense. We literally, it got to about the 60 minute mark when we got to the actual massacre itself and only spent about a good 10 minutes on it. So we can see what really eclipsed most of the massacre part, but the lead up is what was very important, the anticipation of it all right here. I know this is gonna be a lot to unpack. Some of y'all are gonna have to watch this more than once in order to really understand and grasp what this is displaying right here. But as you can already tell, 
history has a way of repeating itself because as I was reading this I'm sitting here saying to myself a lot of what's happening here while not as intense is happening right now so with that being said we will be back here next Wednesday for episode 14 of the Black Massacre series. And not only will we be doing episode 14, but this will be the first Black Massacre series episode that we will be doing that is occurring in the 1900s. This was the last one of the 1800s. We will be heading into the 1900s next week, which, of course, will be the beginning of the 20th century. Stay safe and be one.